Well, welcome. I want to thank everybody for showing up today. Um, we're going to try to work between the raindrops and try to strategically hit some things to stay dry. So we will be um, kind of stay close together. Part of what we're going to do today is an exercise uh, that folks are, are using throughout their communities to look at their community differently. So you may hear this as a walking tour, a walking audit, a Jane's walk. It's a simply an act of us getting out in the community, walking and looking. Within the group, we have experts. All of you are experts in something. All of you will identify something that I won't identify. Shout it out, talk about it. If you see something, if a question, or something that we should all be aware of, we should talk about it. So as I walk down here, we're gonna walk about a block and come back, and we will be within eyesight of this. If you guys wanna to continue to walk after that, please feel free. We're gonna walk past restaurants and ice cream shops and things like that, so you may wanna backtrack on your way back. Um, I have two tools that I'm willing to pass around. These are measuring wheels. Now, they twist to collapse down, so if you don't wanna be rolling them around. Uh, if you see at the bottom, there's a wheel and a little piece. You can measure as we cross the street and see the measurement in feet and inches. And then if you press a button, it goes zero. So as we're walking around the day, I'd like all of you to take, take a time, wheel things out, the measures of sidewalks. When we get to some place that it feels uncomfortable, it's worth measuring. If we get some place that you really like, it's worth measuring because we will start to, to identify those patterns. Uh, the other secret tool I always carry is something to write on. So we gave you some paper outlining what a walking audit is. Feel free to mark all that up. I will send you all where we have that on our website. So you can print it out, share it. All of the stuff from Strong Towns is all open uh, creative content. So if you want to make it look like your town, white out Strong Towns, put your town on it. We don't care. The purpose of it is to get this messaging out. Now, on the walking audit, we've got Tony, will be at the back of our group. He'll make sure we're moving. If I, for, by some chance, lose somebody, he will bring them up. The other thing is I will probably walk backwards. I will probably walk into traffic. Tell me if I'm gonna run into something. My wife will appreciate that. Um, I'm a risk taker on it. Some of the things that, that I do in walking audits is to gauge traffic by getting close to it. I have a big vest to see, hopefully people see me, um, but use, when we do these tours, just be aware of your surroundings. As we get somewhere, we bunch up. If people need to get through, let them do their, their thing. They will probably look at us and think that we're strange people. Uh, be, go ahead and explain to them what we're doing. If we need more flyers to hand out to them, Tony's got extra ones, so we could do that. I think people are always interested in what we're seeing in their town. Now, as we kick this off, is anybody in this group from Cincinnati? All first timers in the city or relatively new? Great. I could tell you all different types of history about this town. I grew up in Columbus, which is about two hours uh, north of here. Uh, we have lots of stories about Cincinnati that have nothing to do with Cincinnati, but make Columbus look great. So I, I will share that. We're gonna walk down this way and work our way over to the plaza. I think you guys noticed, we stopped outside the hotel in the rain and we're dry. Did you guys notice there were, there's that canopy over the street, over the sidewalk? Many of your towns probably, if you told the street engineer that you were gonna put something over the sidewalk, they would have a heart attack. Um, the lawyers may tell you that there's legal issues that may occur with that. Yeah. Who's gonna maintain it? What if it falls? Yeah, so there's some, I just wanna point out, something I noticed as we're walking here, this is the same building we can see the canopy and it's been hit. So if I was to do another canopy, I would probably slide it back a little bit. When I start to look at the streets here, there's some interesting things happening with the sidewalks. Um, also here, if you notice, there, as we get to this intersection, the alignment of the streets off. You see how there's like in this block, there's something going on at this intersection. So, so we're here at this intersection. 
Um, we're just standing back here because we can be out of the rain, uh, but feel free to walk back and forth as we look. So in this particular block, we noticed something different with the buildings. Does anybody want to point out what's happening? They're a lot They're high buildings. Mm -hmm. We also are seeing, if we look at the street here, there's part of a block here that's actually pushed back. So as we walk around, we can spatially see that there's something different happening here in this intersection with the way the street alignment is. Um, we can also see with this particular block that there's this civic space yeah. over here. Yeah, but the question, apparently the population of this town peaked 1950 to 1960. It was over 500,000 people. Today it was about 350. So these look to have been built in the 70s after the population dropped, but they're quite nice buildings. What was that drop in population about? Was it suburbs? I mean, did the people really all leave the area or did they just move outside the city limits? Uh, Cincinnati saw growth and what we would call unproductive growth. Uh -huh. So when we look at, as we look, if we would if we were looking at mapping of the city, and you, if you were to Google it and look at it now, right. you could see Cincinnati with this regular grid. It got blocked by the hillsides. So right. if you look at the topography, it kept everything tight. Uh -huh. As soon as we could get over the hillsides, uh -huh. you could see up 71 and up 75 where all of the growth occurred. Oh. The highways were built. Highways were built. The suburban development pattern occurs. Uh -huh. So in the region, they saw increase of population, but the the number of people per acre, they started the whole expansive bit out. Right. So there's a set of slides we use and share in relation to um, in California the Fresno California mapping. If we were to look at here in Hamilton County, you would see something very similar, probably at a much larger scale. Okay. So that's part of it. Um, we also in Cincinnati have a lot of corporate in the city, there's a lot of corporate headquarters. Right. We won't make it all the way down to Kroger on Vine Street, uh, but if you go to over the Rhine, if you follow Vine Street up, that's Kroger's headquarters, their big grocery conglomerate in front of their building. I know nothing about it other than I walked it, but they've got this beautiful flush streetscape yeah. with public art, and really one of the most, like nicest streets if you want to see that. Um, it's a little too far for this walk, but you, you should check that. And then they have, Miner sitting on the next block, they have a downtown grocery store, their Kroger grocery store there, which is kind of interesting to see in the downtown. We're gonna walk across this way. Let's see if we can catch this light. And if we miss some people, we'll, we'll pause over there. So one of the things that I notice a lot when we talk about um, our crash analysis studios at, at high speeds, whenever somebody says somebody isn't comfortable at an intersection, I usually look at the aerial. I pull up the Google map and look at it. If you look here, you can begin to see something really kind of odd. We've got this diagonal crosswalk. When we do the diagonal crosswalk, our geometries change. So the pedestrians have a further travel. Uh, you're at an odd angle. Yeah, 60 feet is, you know, that's a house. It's a long distance um, between there. It's very wide too, the crosswalk. I don't understand why it's... And we look at, it doesn't meet the PROAG or ADA, right? So if you go across this, none of those truncated domes match up. They're not at the right amount, right uh, angles. And even across the street, see how it curves up? Mm -hmm. So if you had uh, assisted devices, uh, you'd have to go around that manhole. So these are some of the things here. Um, and that's all maintenance stuff. That's not a lot of, like, this doesn't take, this is stuff that our public works people could do in a city to fix these. Um, if we look here, in Cincinnati, we'll see more of this where this striping, see all the paint on the road? Uh, there's a paint to tell the driver where to go. 
And I find it curious, these planters on all the corners. Like, I don't think they're doing... Crash into our glass front here. Yeah, I don't think they like are there for beautification. Um, and you can see that maintenance of is kind of difficult. So that's when, when you look at these intersections, uh, also seeing the stuff up above. So if we look, there's different types, multiple lights in areas. So this probably wasn't the right type of light to do. So they had to add an extra one. Then they, people shouldn't do stuff, so they put a sign up. When you think about from a driver perspective, how many times uh, you have to make decisions. So there's lots of decisions we made there. Let's kind of walk through this plaza. I know it's raining. Well, there's some cover on the other side. But if we look at the plaza, we can see the alignment of the street, see what the urban designers have done. I was out here this morning with some folks, and we looked at these steps. This is, these don't meet the typical step, and you can see they've had some issues. They've had to put um, the white markers on it. Yeah, I, I've yet to find congestion in the downtown. I've been here a couple of days, and I, I haven't found congestion. I haven't found like when a traffic light hits where the whole city sh shuts down. Uh, it's only about three or four cars deep at those intersections. Uh, but on all the streets, even on like the street here, if you notice in front of the steakhouse, there's something different on this street. And I didn't notice it when I first walked here until I saw where that police car is. And maybe we'll jump back, back in the rain a little bit. But, but in the downtown, on all the streets, there's all of this parallel parking. And then all of a sudden there's something different here. And if, yeah, so there's some angled parking. And if we were to measure this sidewalk to that sidewalk on the other side of the street, we would find a difference. So what they've done there in front of that steakhouse is actually built out. Now there's a couple of things that you notice when they do that. Um, not only is the sidewalk wider, uh, we can see they've got the landscaping in there, but also look at the, at the base of the building. So this is a glass tower like all the rest, but look at the base. That restaurant has actually doubled its square footage out over the, the patio. And it's got, you know, the temporary but it's heated and cooled all, all year round. Uh, but you could see how that now becomes a productive use in the downtown. So yeah, there's a lot of really interesting things happening here, even so much so you could see they've got barricades where they've blocked. There's parts of the street they don't need to use. They've wrapped it. This square, all I didn't understand what was happening here. It took me a while. So this is giant square. And then with all these retailers, but there's this. So part of this is what we walked by for the garage underneath all of this block. And then they've wrapped it with other stuff and they've gone up. Just kind of interesting. We're gonna walk down this way and take a shortcut through the building to the other side of the street. Can you see the reflection? It's hard, it, when it's sunnier, when cars are driving, that reflects down. If you subconsciously are getting, it's like a strobe light as cars drive by. It, it's, it needs to be a little more matte. I, I like this detail. This is where landscape architects really shine. So on these boxes, uh, there's a grade up to the plaza. On this side, they've actually used it for something, right? They've got these nice benches that are in. Uh, we could debate on what they look at of, of the benefit to it, but I think it's... They're talking. Yeah. yeah. It gives you a sense of enclosure, so you want to sit there. But yeah, when it is um, not raining, this is actually a pretty neat little plaza. Um, we're going to walk across here so we can experience this. And there is a cool alley piece. So I don't know if people want to walk straight ahead or around the museum side. Is there a preference? Is there something that people see that gets them excited? Alley. Yeah, alley looks great. Okay, <laughs> okay. No, no 
So I know we have some avid cyclists here. Any thought? Any thoughts on the parking? It's better not. Probably gonna get hit. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know where the front door is. The the whole eyes on the street. Right. It's probably pretty cool for the bar across the street, but like down here, um, I think I assume that this building has underground parking and closed yes. parking. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you get. Kind of a little bit. It's great for the pedestrians, right? Protection. Like we get the buffer protection for the pedestrians. Uh, like, and you can see on the, the building, see the, the protection on the drain spout. So they put a little bit more cautious thought in that than the cyclist. So we, we can start to see where this alley system and the alleys here in Cincinnati are fascinating, especially as you get to over the Rhine, because they're the little, like, they probably were streets at one point. They're, they're probably only about nine feet wide and they're brick. How feet wide? Nine. Nine feet wide. So when you go, if you, if you go to over the Rhine, you'll see, you'll start to pass through these. Okay, for our, uh, the non Cincinnatians among us, over the Rhine, it's called that. I know there was an enormous and is German population here. Yeah, Cincinnati, this is what I learned last night from the assistant city manager in Cincinnati. Cincinnati was emerging the same time as Chicago was emerging. Cincinnati put all of its bets on steamboats, paddle boats, up the Ohio. They also put all their, with that, they put all their bets into the canal system. The Erie Canal was so popular, they wanted a canal system for the river boats. Same time, Chicago put all of its bets on rail. Two cities emerged at the same time. Which transportation system took the country by storm? Which is the major metropolis today? Uh, so it was that piece. Over the Rhine, you had to actually cross there a couple of, you had to cross a waterway, one of those canals and waterway. So the Germans, it was crossing the Rhine. That's how that, you don't see it. And I, um, it's on the map. It, I don't remember the name, but one of the streets is now a linear parkway. And when we talk about canals, they were the small two boat, like it wasn't, it wasn't like the Mississippi. Yeah. Yeah. It was utilitarian to get goods from the high river up. So we'll go down this way because this just looks pretty cool. Yeah. But, but I love the development here, and I don't know how much is old and new. Um, but who would, have put al who would have put windows on an alleyway? Yeah. Right? So, like, if you put a little time and thought into the spaces we build, it actually adds value. So, you know, this whole restaurant gets a natural light. They get to see what's happening out here. They can laugh at us in the rain. So, a cool little theater area. We've got the streetcar line. The, um, one, of the, one of the things we've talked about noise, when you have one-way traffic, that, that allows for less friction. I am mixed personally on the conversion of whether one-way streets are the Satan's child or one-way streets is a way to solve a problem. I'm, not, I'm kind of agnostic in it. There's good and bad for both. Uh, but one of the things, one of the problems when you see that, not only speed, but you hear the noise. So we know cars are driving faster based off that noise because, and they're also ganging together. So you, when we hear all of that moving through, if it was two way, they're a little more cautious, right? Because you don't know who's coming on the streets. Uh, it, frankly, I don't think it would take that much other than changing behavior to convert many of these streets. But some of the alleyways, narrower streets, because they have the one-way couplets, uh, you can see they've closed uh, up Vine Street. They've closed some of the cross streets for different, for whatever reason. I don't know why, but they've created cool little spaces like that that we just went down uh, more organically in the neighborhood. And you could do that when you have the one-way street because people won't get as confused as where they need to go. You can also do that because you have a grid. 
right? If you get lost, you just go up to the next block and you make a right or left and get around to where you need to go. In Columbus, they're converting to two-way and it's the first time ever in the downtown. They've always, and that was the big, like the big thing is, well, we like, it's not, we can go through all the safety pieces, but the debate they're having there is, well, we've always had it one way. We've never known it any other way. And it just, it's kind of that pattern in these gridded towns. You could see like here, again, how do we protect the parklet? Cause we're so concerned about that. But also I saw this in Denver last week. Like here are three different temporary features, four different temporary features that probably most public works offices can order cause it's in the catalogs they know or they have in the shop. Yeah, so you got the baller there with the reflector on it. That probably takes like a lift to get on there. You got these plastic ones that you can fill with water or sand. So they're really easy to slide into place and the top you fill up uh, if you need to. And then you've got the rubber curb and the little delineator stick. So again, these are not, these are things you would use if a pipe broke on a street to protect it while you did that work. Uh, we can also do it for stuff like this to add productivity to our streets. It's, I, I think that's a bike rack. Yeah, I, I think. <laughs> and that's when like the public works director says, oh, those are so expensive. <laughs> well, yeah, because you. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna throw some numbers out there. I, I'm convinced if every Ohioan was invited to Cincinnati on a Saturday, they would have at least four parking spaces available for them in the downtown. Uh, I don't know if you guys have been over towards the stadiums, so towards the river. So the city went through the process of lowering 71 and then redid the stadiums. Everything between the stadiums, between 71 and the river and the two stadiums, is a giant parking deck that has a cap over it. There's like three stories of parking down there. It, it, tons and tons of parking. When we look at shop fronts on the main street, on this area, we have three different ways that architects have dealt with the street for people. We won't even talk about the car garages. So we have some that, that provide us this inset. Here's one that's like kind of grandiose, um, but you see in the other buildings there, those small entry points. Uh, from a retail side, see the glass, you're wrapped in the glass. So not only do you have one pane of glass for merchandising, you actually end up with four around that and people can actually they're entering into your store before they even open the door if we look at the more modern and where they've done this you've got the right proportion for windows but um, doesn't have the same effect and you can also see like they're not taking advantage of any of that merchandising yeah, yeah. They, you don't have the you could see that you don't have the merchandising because they they put paper or maybe they're renovating there but you can't see in those windows like you can those a coffee shop yeah but it's but it doesn't invite you in yeah people like people like if you saw a bunch of people that look like you you walk over there oh what's going on right so right now it's like well i'm not a goat but i might want coffee right um, yoga yeah the other thing is traditionally the shop fronts over here see that glass at the top that allows more light into the shop right. if we were to go over there now Many times those ceilings get dropped, the architects drop it for all the mechanical junk uh, because we can mechanically light, heat, and cool the spaces versus previously where you could do it with the natural sun. We come to this side, which is this large piece, and they have, they have a lot of glass on the street, but um, this is what they've opted for. If we, if we think about that font size, that is not a font size for us. Like we have to actually be further out to the street to read that. That is for people going down the street at 35 miles an hour. So um, it also, you know, it could just as easily be at the top of the glass so we could see what's happening in here. Um, part, part of what I've experienced through kind of the walking audits uh, is if you're designing, like we're designing for people, so we're walking like people but also driving yourself. Because you lay this out, you have all the functionality, right? From a transportation side, we, the transportation guy's got everybody through town. 
we did it safely, we added the extra cushioning to lanes. If we measure the lanes, they're probably 12 feet, you know, they're, they're, so you have a little correctiveness in it. Um, we made sure we cleared out everything so that you're focused on the road and there's a trap. You saw that there's lights to signal to get you in and out of the garages. But the fact that people would actually get out in to go to a hotel, which, you know, several hundred rooms is going to happen a lot. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't think about that till you actually have that experience. There's a lot of construction happening in Cincinnati. One of the things that I've seen about half the time they do, uh, when a sidewalk gets closed, well, let's say when a street gets closed, what do they do? They put signs to tell you a detour of where to go. When they close the sidewalk, they're also supposed to do that. So you can see over here, there's signage. Uh, according to PROAG and those recommendations, so American for Disabilities, you, should, you shouldn't get across the corner and be stranded. So you can see they protected over here in the street, they've closed part of the sidewalk, but they've kept the corner open so we can function all the way around. And you can see they put a sign up to tell the pedestrians how to get around the block because that's closed. I think that's the most uninviting building I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, but you can see here, we've had all the experiences. Um, we walked through this building previously, that's where we went through. It's a parking garage, but you can see on the ground level, they put in retail space. This is a really, really easy thing to do on garages. And I assure you that retail space yields more than any parking space that would be in its equivalent spot. You're creating jobs, you've got activity, sales tax, business tax, all of those things. Uh, plus you have a nice streetscape, things you want to see. Yeah. These are the cool alleys that I'm seeing in Cincinnati. Look how narrow these. I mean, this is a Philadelphia street width. Right. I mean, it, but it, it's, they're very cool. You'll see them all around as you're walking around the next couple of days. What is it? This is an alleyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but the width of it, I don't know if we measure it. This is probably the same width of a street in Philadelphia. Huh. This is thinner than a lot of streets in Philadelphia. So there's a car nine, nine parked feet, at the end. Yeah, nine feet, nine, ten feet, yeah. So you couldn't use it for the shortcut to the other street at this moment, right? Behind yeah, they didn't walking. see the no parking sign. Yeah, they, yeah. They didn't. <laughs> In cities, we deal with grade all the time. And we also have to deal with accessibility. And I just noticed here some, like, we just walked right up to a flat level. Uh -huh. And then we have stairs here. Uh, if we go around lots of places, there's lots of designers and engineers and architects that do a lot of gymnastics to get you safely up and comfortably up to a front door. Here, by using those window tricks, using the retail tricks, we could see how gradually you're right up to the main entrance of this. And if you're um, able body, you have the ability to go right out on the stairs. It's really kind of a seamless thing. This is, you know, Somebody's done this, and we probably may be the only people that appreciate it, but it's a really like nice detail when you think about how to build this stuff in. So, we, And we can see what they've done here. Um, I can't tell what's underneath there, whether they just retrofitted over the top of the asphalt or not, but this is that little area block that popped out. We can see here where the sidewalk has gotten wider. Oh yeah, it's very wide. So why is it wider here? I, I would like to know. I'm, yeah. I'm curious myself. I, I think it's actually really nice. We'll go back to the hotel lobby so we can sit more comfortably and close out. But here we are where we started this really interesting intersection. If you want to see a different perspective of the intersection, there's a sky bridge. If you go into the hotel on the main hotel lobby, which is that second floor, if you go past the desk through the mall, you'll end up on that sky bridge and you can see this intersection from above. And there's, it's kind of interesting all the geometries that are here. And again, we're, we're in this intersection, we can see, like we can't see the fountain. So I think everybody that went with us made it back. And if not, Tony and I will go out look, looking for them. Uh, we gave you those, those sheets. If you need more sheets, Tony has more if you'd like those. Uh, I will make sure that we, we have that on the Strong Towns 
Action Lab site. That is our resource library. There's some other tools up there. Uh, we'll make sure by next week you all get an email directly to that. Everything we share on those sites is up for sharing. It's all open creative content. Please feel free to, to do whatever you need with that form to go out in your community. We tried to put some things there about talking and, and to get you comfortable with those, those walks. What I have found is when we do these walking on, everyone I've ever gone on, and this was kind of a sampling, but usually there's some sort of purpose. We want to talk about our community, or there's a spot that we're struggling with in the community, or we, we saw another community we liked, we want to go explore there what they did so we could bring that back. Every time I go, I find in the group there is an expert that knows something about it. Like we got somebody that told, told us all about Cincinnati. That wasn't expected, that was the organic piece that came from it. I've been walking audits before where I've had specialists that know about the trees and the landscaping. I've had utility people that, for the first time, you're in an environment where you can share things in a, as a group, as a way to all learn. The other piece to it is that once you go out and you start pointing things out, like when I pointed things out in crosswalks and uh, we looked at shop fronts, these are things that now you're going to go around and you're not going to be able to unsee it. So I apologize if there are things I've ruined for you in the built world around you that you see, like, why did they do that? Uh, but, but this is what happens. And what I find is unlike, when we talk at Strong Towns about public participation, this is a part of public engagement and participation that is better than Tuesday night at City Hall with dots and maps and drawings. People can't read that. The aerial maps, my wife and I go back and forth. I like the map with the picture. She likes the map with the bars. So she goes, I want the pipe map and I need to see the aerials. We see things individually differently. By going out and walking, we now have a common experience with each other. We have a little fun with it and we can see these things and we can actually, like why, why do we want that tight radius at the intersection? When we stand there and we see the cars go fast, Oh, I don't need to tell you what the radius is, but I can tell you we want to, it, what we saw was not right. Or if we were to go out there and see a car go over a curb, we could say, well, that, we know that that was not right. We don't, we don't need to be science, the engineers, street engineers for it to know that. We just can experience it. So for a lot of communities that I found where people are talking across each other and not with each other, a lot of times people, it's an opportunity for neighbors to meet themselves if they haven't met each other before. Mm -hmm. uh, the Jane walks are really fun because that is like not a plan or speak thing. This is the idea of walking through your community. And what I find is people point out the things they like in the community. Oh, this is my favorite shop. Oh, this is my favorite yeah. park bench. Uh, and you introduce that to folks. So a Jane walk is, uh, it comes out of inspiration from Jane Jacobs. It's this idea of getting a community, your community together to go out and do a walk as a community, much like we did here. So there is an entire site dedicated to Jane's Walk, there's an entire organization for that. Uh, they usually do it around her birthday. So it's just kind of a, a way to, an excuse for people to go out as a group to walk their community. Uh, all of those usually lead to this kind of the gateway drug to other good things in your community. You do a Jane's Walk, and we saw today a couple of those parklets. Now you've got a group of folks that have met together, you walked around, and also you hear about this thing called Parking Day, where people take over parking spaces and make it into more effective things, like little outdoor parklets that put down AstroTurf or benches and block off a parking space to make it something better. Uh, that's now your cohort group of folks to do that, because you saw that somewhere else, and you take advantage of it. Um, so yeah, if you go out, there's a couple of Facebook pages, there's organizations that do Jane Walks, uh, so that's that type of exercise. Uh, you do not have to have technical folks, the people that show up are the right people.
Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this special video profiling the how to host a walking tour workshop led by Edward Erfurt and part of the Strong Towns National Gathering here in Cincinnati, Ohio on Tuesday, May 14th, 2024. And a huge shout out and thank you heading out to Edward Erfurt for letting me shadow him on this walking tour. Please refer to the video description down below for links on the Strong Towns website. And uh, again, thank you so much. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, please be sure to subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. Well, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.